So hi, I am not a morning person, but I'm absolutely delighted to be here in Melbourne, which I believe to be one of the most beautiful and interesting and wonderful cities in the entire world. And every time I come here, I'm just more and more charmed by it. So I want to thank all of you for having me, and especially the folks at, at Paws and Fluoro for all the hard work you did putting this together. Um, okay, so we're here today to talk about the future, to talk about innovation, to talk about what it is we're creating and making. And we will do that. Oh, I don't have a clicker. Sorry, I just realized something was very missing. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, so we're here to talk about the future. But before we do that, I think we need to start by taking a little look into the past. Um, basically, Technology and innovation is happening on a scale that is so much faster than, oh yeah, sure, um, than what happens in evolution. And so consequently, we have to make sure that we're taking our human impulses into account with everything that we design and make. Basically, we have some really innate human impulses, which are learning, sharing, playing, and exploring. These do not change over time, and technology doesn't change them. Your grandparents had these, in, had these impulses, and your grandchildren will have these impulses. So anything that you design technologically has to support these activities, learning, sharing, playing, and exploring. And if you're not covering these bases, then the absolute best you might be doing is making a tech gadget. Nothing that will be integral to our lives, or anything that will be integral to our lives has to support this. Right now, today in 2017, we actually are living a split existence between screen space and real space. So screen space is anytime you're looking at a device, anytime you're interacting with data. Um, this could be your laptop, it could be your phone, it could be a giant screen that's hanging over your head. It doesn't matter. If you are focusing on two-dimensional space, you have actually left the physical space that we inhabit behind and moved into that space. We do this so quickly that most of us aren't even aware that we do it. We do it on like microscopic levels. We do it all the time. But for those of you who are over 40 and have maybe started to get presbyopia and have your eyes go bad, you start to realize at that point when you can no longer focus up close just how often you do this. We do it constantly. But this is going to change because we know from virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality that the screen's dominance in our lives is going to begin to recede. No longer are you going to be leaving real space and going into screen space to see your data. Instead, the entire world is going to be your computing environment, and your data and information is going to live right here alongside you. There's no longer going to be this idea that this contains data and this contains world. It's all going to be mixed up and jumbled up together. And so that makes this entire exercise significantly more visceral and intimate than any kind of experience we've ever had with data before, because there's not literally a divide and a boundary between data and you any longer. It all coexists. And what that means, and this is a piece that I think it's missed a lot, is that you cannot just approach this as an intellectual argument. You absolutely cannot. It's an emotional argument. It's, it's, it, it involves all of us holistically, not just our brains, but our hearts and our guts and our bodies and our feet and our planet. And that's how we have to be thinking about this. Because we're going to talk about feelings. So everybody take a really big sip of that flat white have a bite of your banana and like hunker down because that's where we're going. So this, as I'm sure you're familiar, is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Pretty much everybody has seen it and we're all like, yeah, 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 breathing, food, water, sex, shelter, etc. Those are the sort of bottom level. And we all understand that. But what I think we don't tend to understand as a species is that third level, that green level in the middle that says friendship, family, sexual intimacy, and on the side, it says love and belonging. Love and belonging are absolutely essential. And until we each as individuals 
feel as though we're loved and we belong, we cannot move up the pyramid. And it's up at the top that creativity and problem solving live. So if we don't take care of this base layer, we're never going to get up there to solve the problems that exist in the world. So there's um, a researcher and professor named Dr. Brene Brown who works at the University of Houston in Texas, and she's absolutely brilliant. If you're not familiar with her work, I highly recommend watching her two TED Talks tonight. It's, it's the best 40 minutes you'll ever spend in your life. But she talks a lot about the concepts of fitting in and belonging. And it's really, really interesting because one of the things she found is that her definition of fitting in is understanding the rules and showing that you understand the rules by conforming to the rules and being accepted for this conformity. Belonging, on the other hand, is showing up exactly as you are and being accepted exactly how you are, even if you don't necessarily fit in. So I'm sitting here in front of you today to tell you that I watch too many cartoons, I'm terrified of birds, and I dress like a homeless person from the future. That is who I am. So do I fit in? Uh, probably not. But I really, really hope that here at PAUSE, this can be a place where I belong. And of course, Touch ID has decided to suddenly not understand my left hand, because that's just how life goes. OK. So um, Brene Brown said, and I'm going to just read this because I can't put it better than she did. A deep sense of love and belonging is an irreducible need of all women, men, and children. We are biologically, cognitively, physically, and spiritually wired to love, to be loved, and to belong. When those needs are not met, we don't function as we were meant to. We break. We fall apart. We numb. We ache. We hurt others. We get sick. There are certainly other causes of illness, numbing, and hurt, but the absence of love and belonging will always lead to suffering. The absence of love and belonging will always lead to suffering. And online communities have been a tremendous thing in the lives of a lot of people. There are a lot of folks who have struggled to fit in and belong in their real lives, who have found places online where they feel as if they do. However, there is an issue here, which is that the time spent in online communities, much as the time you spend fitting in takes away from your ability to belong, the time you spend online in these communities weakens your bonds with your physical environment and the people who are actually around you. In addition, a lot of these communities, because they tend to be built or formed around people that share a specific interest, can become echo chambers, where people just magnify the way that they already feel and spin each other up, instead of having to come to terms with the diversity of opinions and people and perspectives that are naturally found all around them. So when we look at the history of technology and what we're doing with innovation, Mistakes have been made. This is a traffic jam in Bangkok. This happens every single day in Bangkok. But if you change out the scenery, it could just as easily be Cairo, or Rome, or Los Angeles, or Rio, or Beijing, or Istanbul. This is the scene around the world every single day. We formed lines of angry people sitting in cars just wishing they could be somewhere else. I don't believe for one second that this is what Carl Friedrich Benz was thinking about when he helped create the first automobiles. This was not what Henry Ford and his employees worked to enable. This is an unintended consequence of a very well-intentioned technological innovation. Similarly, there are some really smart people at Google who realized one day that there is a ton of information that is found in photographs that isn't available online in a searchable form. Using deep learning, they built an algorithm that can actually look at photographs and tell you what's in there. This is tremendous work that was done by really smart people working really, really hard to be able to feed a photograph to a computer and have it say, that's a skyscraper, that's a bicycle. But unfortunately, it sometimes gets things wrong. And when it does, it's really, really not OK. And in addition, I think it's really worth pointing out that while the Google Photos algorithm does tag lots of things correctly, and it is tremendous, like cars and graduation ceremonies, 
We don't remember the fact that it got the skyscraper right. We remember the fact that it got the people wrong. And so as we're working in technology, we have to remember that we're defined by our mistakes more than by our successes. And we'll come back and talk about that a bit more. Similarly, in early last year, Microsoft um, put the TayBot out into Twitter. Tay stands for thinking about you. And Tay was designed to show how far um, communication with an AI has come, how, how much Tay can, can partake in an engaging conversation. But unfortunately, they taught Tay to learn, but they didn't teach Tay about the boundaries of acceptable speech and interaction. So it took less than 18 hours before Tay went from saying, humans are super cool, to speaking hate speak. It took 18 hours before Microsoft had to remove Tay from Twitter because of a public relations nightmare that they were staring down. And then there's this one. In the hopes of using an algorithm to remove the bias that people bring to curating and reporting, Facebook fired the editorial staff of their trending, um, their trending feature in the summer of last year. Because we all have biases and we all have preferences, every single one of us, they thought that it would be more fair to actually let an algorithm do this because the algorithm would just measure engagement. And while it's true that the algorithm measured engagement absolutely perfectly, the algorithm had no ability to understand truth from lie. And so what happened was, as several news uh, um, outlets have reported, a bunch of teenagers in Macedonia were able to trick the algorithm and put a bunch of blatantly false articles that Facebook promoted as trending. And because most people across the world had no idea that the human that used to intercede between the algorithm and the trending page had been removed, people didn't understand that this was fake news, that this wasn't real reporting. And I think that this is a really important thing to point out here, is I'm not saying that Facebook wanted to do this. I think every single one of the technological innovations we're looking at today was created with the best intentions in heart and in mind. But by not really thinking about how they could be exploited or twisted, they left themselves vulnerable and open to a lot of things. Technology has basically given everyone the ability through blogs and YouTube to have their own TV channel and to have their own newspaper. And that is a noble goal. Democratization of expression is a noble goal. It's a good thing. But the unintended consequence of doing this is that we dealt an almost deadly blow to journalism. And even as newspapers were dying and folding, they said, hey guys, you need us. We are important. Objective journalism is important for the stability of, of your society and to hold everything together. But we didn't listen. We just kept blindly pushing forward. And as anybody who's been in a situation like this knows, it's almost impossible to get the cat back into the bag. But that's where we are today. And this is what I mean when I talk about unintended consequences. Because throughout history, the explorers and dreamers, which is probably what you see yourself as, you wouldn't be here today at Paws in Melbourne if you didn't see yourself as a person that was devoted to building a better world. We've looked to technology to make things better. I've spent nearly two decades working on the future, and I came to it as an optimist, and I'm still an optimist today, but I do have some pretty serious concerns. I don't believe that the telephone was created in the hopes that one day I would have to watch every single concert I go through through someone's Samsung Galaxy Note 7 phone, right? I don't believe that Microsoft supports hate speech, and I'm certainly not calling Google racist. I don't believe any of these things. In fact, I believe every single bit of this was done for good, but they didn't quite think through it enough. And that's why the point is that being good is not good enough. I bring up all of these cases to show that even with the best of intentions, you can create a product that is ultimately harmful. This is a lesson that we absolutely have to learn. Empathy is a conscious choice. I have been guilty of this just as much as everyone else has, of believing that because I am a good person with good intentions, that I am immediately empathetic. But this is not true. 
we tend to think that the human attached to the system we're creating at the end is the easy part to solve, but that is not true. We aren't necessarily empathetic just because we're good. We have to really take the time to slow down and think and put ourselves in someone else's shoes to avoid these problems. Because you know what they say about the road to hell. And right now, we are just a pile of good intentions and technology. All right, so let's talk about how to get it wrong. This is where we are today. We are on the edge of a giant paradigm shift. Here we are, we're letting somebody put a headset on and put information directly into our eyeballs. This isn't story time anymore, okay? That, A Clockwork Orange, the book, the movie, that is story time. What is being done to Alex and what we are doing to people through virtual and augmented reality, that is no longer story time. Way back in the early 80s, my little sister watched the movie Jaws. She is 40 years old. She is still terrified of sharks to this day. And she watched that on a 22-inch TV that was way far away from her. If that movie had happened in her head, I can't even imagine what we might have done to her. And most of the dialogue about technology and about innovation is about specifications, is about feature set, is about what we're enabling today. But, and I can't emphasize this enough, technology is not about breakthroughs. Innovation is about the unintended long-term consequences of the decisions that we're making today. So like we saw with the Google Images, we don't celebrate the fact that it works most of the time. We talk about the fact that it doesn't. Or as my favorite graphic designer of all time, Tibor Kalman, once said, we don't talk about planes flying, we talk about planes crashing. But if you think about it, the fact that a plane flies is way crazier than the fact that it crashes. So we have to approach this from a really holistic and humanistic viewpoint, because if we don't, we're in a world of hurt. I like to show Wally because I think none of us want this to be our future. But at the same time, of all the dystopian visions that's out there, if I have to pick one, I'm going to take this one. Because the people don't seem miserable. The people don't seem scared. And if we're not careful, we could just as easily end up here. This is Hyperreality by Kaichi Matsuda, which is an eight minute long video that hit the web a few months ago and basically scared the shit out of everybody working in VR. If you haven't watched it, do yourself a favor, take the 10 minutes and watch it. This is the kind of thing that's really easy for us to look at and dismiss and say, oh my God, that is so extreme, that is so crazy, we will never let that happen. But I'm sure that that is what Henry Ford would say about the traffic jams if we had shown them to him back in his time. So we need to slow down. It will never be easier to fix the mistakes and the issues that are happening in our emerging tech than they are today. It is always easier to nip bad behavior in the bud when it's early and when it's young. So slow down. Make an effort to anticipate the issues that your technological innovation may be creating. I understand that this isn't as sexy as a really long feature list, but it's way more important than the long term. All right, so that's how to get it wrong. How do we connect? I apologize for the bad language. If you're offended, please look away. This is um, one day of hate mail that a woman named Anita Sar Sarkeesian receives every single day. This is just one day of the death threats, of the garbage that people spew at her, because she is a woman who talks about gaming. Online gaming has been a great example of unintended consequences because it was something that was created to bring together people with a shared love of gaming. I love gaming. I'm sure that a lot of you in this room love gaming. The fact that I can find someone to play Dominion with me at three o'clock in the morning when I'm jet lagged and can't sleep makes me incredibly happy. I love this. But at the same time, the unintended consequence is that it has opened up a floodgate for people to harass other people who they don't agree with. I don't want to drag you through Gamergate. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. So let's instead, let's talk about something really positive. This is Journey. Journey is a game that was created for the PlayStation 3 by a company called That Game Company. And the reason we're talking about it is because it's, well, it's my favorite game of the last decade. But even beyond that, 
they stripped out everything that wasn't important to this game to focus on what really, really mattered to them. So they found that they wanted to create a game that would allow people to really, really connect. And they needed it to work across the world, because this is a PlayStation game. PlayStation exists everywhere. And they realized that they could tap into universal emotions, like I was talking at the, about at the beginning, learning and sharing and playing and exploring, that they could tap into those things without needing language by creating something that's more primitive and more visceral. So when you're playing Journey and you come across another character, that represents a real person that's playing the game somewhere else in the world. And it actually puts you together, and the game expects you to work together. You cannot speak, you cannot type. All you have is a call, a harmonic chord that represents your character that you can put into the world to get someone else's attention. That's all you can do is say hello. By doing this, it was really, really smart because they completely got away from the need to do localization, which if you've ever done it is a gigantic pain in the ass and it never comes out well. So it was really cunning of them to build a system that didn't need translation. But that was cunning, but what was brilliant is that they created a system where it is impossible to harass somebody. You cannot call somebody stupid. You cannot call someone ugly. You cannot be mean to a person in Journey. The absolute worst thing you can do is to walk away from them. It's brilliant. And as the game goes on, you start to, you're climbing a mountain, and you start to freeze, and you start to get cold, you start to slow down, your energy meter just starts to drain, even if you're there, because the environment is taking so much out of you. But if you stay with your companion, if you cling to your companion and help your companion, you can charge each other. You can keep each other moving. The first time that I finished Journey, my companion had played the game more than I had. And when we finished, he started doing this weird little dance around me, and I was like, what in the world is going on? And then the camera pulled out, and I realized that she had drawn a heart in the snow and left me with that message. And I cried my eyes out. And I know you trust me because you can hear that I'm about to do it again, but I'm not. But I'm not. I'm not. But I do want to say that lest you think I'm just a sappy American girl, which I am a sappy American girl, there are entire message boards that are still active a decade after this game was released, talking about the ways in which Journey breaks your heart and then mends it the ways in which you learn to trust and love by playing this game. I'm going to take a quick moment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I just want to say that it's not uncommon, but it wasn't an accident. Journey only works in this way because it is what they decided to do. Fostering friendship was the core mechanic of this game. Not collecting gold, not shooting bad guys, but actually fostering friendship and caring for someone else. All right, so we've seen how to get it wrong, and we've seen that it can be right. So how do we do more of it right? I am still an optimist, and I believe that we can fix all of this, but we have to start by asking the right questions. These things take time. Virtual reality is not going to appear like Athena fully formed from Zeus's head tomorrow. It's going to have to grow and develop. And the most exciting thing that happened in 2016 in terms of VR is the fact that so many devices launched and went into people's hands. This is how we're going to learn through real data of people really, really working and interacting with things. So when I talk about the right questions, the first one is why. But the question isn't, can I make a spreadsheet in VR? It's, why do you want to make a spreadsheet in VR? It's not, can I use a gestural keyboard to type a message? It's, does texting even make sense in this medium anymore? Is that the right way to communicate when you have a thing strapped to the front of your head? It may be that the best form of asynchronous Communication in the future does not have anything to do with SMS messaging as we know it today. So focus on what's really being said. 
people will give you feedback. People have tons of opinions, let me tell you, but you have to hear underneath the top level of the feedback, which I call the form. Form, like fashion, changes all the time. It changes all the time, but the essence of that feedback, the thing that lies underneath it is relatively stable. You have to learn how to pull the essence out of the form. So to go back to the earlier texting thing, when somebody says, I need to text, I mean, come on, I have to text. It's how I communicate. What they're saying to you isn't that they require SMS messaging. What they're saying to you is that they require asynchronous, simple communication. That is what you have to enable, not text messaging as we know it. And then ask, how can this problem be solved in a way that builds connection? My hope, my big hope, is that VR and AR will support our, our humanity, that they will help us learn to communicate and to bolster us emotionally to help us to truly connect and belong, not just to fit in. Because what makes us interesting as humans is the massive diversity among us. Just looking over the crowd, like I want to like hug all of you. Because each one of us brings a different set of hopes and fears. And if we can learn to embrace that, we can be the most powerful force ever seen. Whew, okay, so. What are the unintended consequences? This is when you get to put on your supervillain pants, okay? You get to put on your Loki horns, you get to be the bad guy and say, okay, I'm the bad guy. How can I twist this to my will? You have to actually be the bad guy as well as the hero of your own story if you're going to keep the, he if you're going to keep the hero winning. You have to take a look at how can people subvert what I want? How can people break what I've built? And then bolster your product against it because these are the unintended consequences that happen when we don't really think things through. Unintended consequences. Unintended consequences. And what safeguards can you put into place when you do find these vulnerabilities and weaknesses? When things are going badly, admit it and fix it. Do not try to be infallible. Do not say we meant that all the time. Say, holy crap, we didn't think about that, but it's really important. Own your mistakes. And to that point, I want to give a huge shout out to the folks at Quiver. I don't know them. I've never even played the game. But Quiver is a VR game, and this is how you appear in it. You're a helmet and a pair of hands. And there was an article that hit the web a couple months ago by a woman named uh, Jordan Bellamere, where she talks about how she was sexually assaulted in Quiver. She'd been playing this game for a while, having a really good time, and she joined a group, and they were doing these raids, and at one point she yelled, hey, come over here. And then as soon as she spoke, people knew she was a woman. And one of the players chased her through the game, literally chased her around the game, trying to grab at the air around her. And when she took the headset off, she felt absolutely violated. She wrote an article about this. And the reason I'm bringing it up is the folks at Quiver took a week, and then they published a response in which they owned up to the problem, they talked about how they were approaching the problem, they shared all the things they tried and whether or not they worked, and shared everything that they had found. They actually created a power gesture, which is like this, which gives you a force field. And it basically puts a little bubble around you. So if a character tries to come at you, they just disappear from your view when they hit your bubble. So people can be chasing you around in a gropey way through the game, but you don't even know it. It doesn't affect you. This is the kind of sharing and learning that I wish everybody working in VR and AR would do because it's the knowledge that we all need of how to keep each other safe and how to be healthy. Okay, so. As this tech becomes more integrated into our lives and into our experiences and even into our bodies, are we going to use it to enhance our connection with each other and with the world around us? Or are we going to use it to further isolate people and drive them back into their echo chambers? I think it's really important that if you're designing VR and AR experiences, that you're designing not just for the person in the headset, but for the people around him or her who aren't wearing the headset. How do you interact with others or muggles, if you will, are you even thinking about that? I don't think most developers are, but it's incredibly important because this is our new reality. A lot of things are going to have to change to support the future that we all want to build. 
And right now, we have the opportunity to actually make these changes and make them better, but only if we have the courage to face the consequences of the decisions we make today. Only if we're brave enough to look into the black mirror of human nature and actually design systems that will build a better future. If we take the time to really think about connection and belonging, then we can use VR to address some of the deep social ills that plague us on a planetary level today as humans. And as a global society, we'll be on our way to a better future in and out of our eyeballs. Thank you. Running short on time, but just, just wanted to confirm, there was a couple of questions through Slido. Um, the TED talk that you referenced about fitting in and belonging, they didn't catch the name to that. Her name is Brene Brown. It's B-R-E-N-E, -E, and the second E has an accent. Uh, brown, just like the color. And she has two talks. Um, watch them in chronological order, because the first one is TEDx Houston, and the second one builds on the first one. And just one question, quickly. Sure. Um, what, this is from, actually, Anonymous, so they, it's not controversial, I don't know why they've gone. Um, it's, what, between AR and VR, which do you think will reach its full potential first? Mm. Um, that's a great question. I don't have a strong opinion. Um, to be completely honest, virtual reality, how do I put this? AR has some baked-in advantages that make it easier. So the fact that you don't replace the world around you means you don't have to worry about things like simulator sickness and making people nauseated by replacing the world and screwing up their inner ear and, and world uh, relationship. So that in, in that way, AR is easier. But in reality, VR, as a designer, often how easy something is is about how much of it you can control. And so VR is a completely controlled thing where you can really control everything that a person sees, hears, and experiences. So in that way, it's an easier system to actually create a great seamless experience in. So I expect that VR will get there first. Okay. So that you shared many examples of unintended consequences when we don't think about empathy or belonging in design. Um, so takeaways for me were slow down, and it's things that teams just don't do, right? They just get running to market, running to market, next features as you mentioned. Asking the right questions, and I think you gave a really interesting example there of why do you want to do X in virtual reality or augmented reality, and is this the right way to communicate and connect? They're really important things to keep in mind. Yes. Thank you so much for your time. Can we have Thank a woo -hoo? you, There's some. Thank you, Alicia.